I'm Andreas. I'm the uh, country manager for EpiServer in Australia and New Zealand. I worked with EpiServer for quite a few years up in Europe as well. And uh, in 2009, uh, I was sent down to start up things here. Luckily uh, enough, Richard joined the team as well. And Richard is the guy who actually knows things. He's the solution architect. Uh, and I'll, I'll, we'll just show a few slides of EpiServer, what is happening right now. We'll uh, talk about a few customers that recently have uh, uh, launched on EpiServer to sort of get you inspired of what you can do with EpiServer. And then we'll jump directly in actually demoing the latest version. So it's going to be pretty much showing the product. It's going to be a big chunk of the first session, if that is okay. And please do ask questions, okay? So what do I do here? So yeah, this is, you've probably seen this before, but uh, EpiServer do run on approximately 30,000 websites worldwide. Uh, we have about 4,700 customers, so it's a very well used toy. 600 partners worldwide. Uh, the main partner we have in Australia and New Zealand is of course Intigen, our international partner of the year many times in a row. Uh, it is an easy tool to use, so we have the uh, 130,000 editors or users working with the product on a daily basis. Our developer community, which I guess a few of you are registered to, we're now up to 19,000 registered members there. And we're doing some cool things there. And of course, we sell licenses. And we grow quite, quite much, as you can see here. Uh, we're the fifth largest market now in the EpiServer world which means that the first two years there were hardly anyone visiting from headquarters. The last four months I think we've had six or eight people <laughs> visiting, so there's a lot more, uh, which is really good, really good. Yeah, so Richard, can you, maybe you can talk about <coughs> some of the latest projects. Okay, absolutely, so we've got a couple of slides here um, with a few screenshots of uh, various sites that have gone live in the last sort of several months or so to give you a bit of flavour as to what's going on around the EpiServer community a little bit and maybe some of the advantages of why, why they work with the EpiServer. So we have Turner's Auctions, which went live probably last month or so, I believe. Mm -hmm. So one of their focuses was to be able to do auctions online, I suppose. And a key factor around that was great performance. So they chose EpiServer because it's easy to use and great performance. So the previous system, I think, their average request is about 36 seconds or something like that. With Epi, they've reduced the servers by more than half and they're getting about two, 300 millisecond response times with um, their auctions now. And of course, they're working in um, a responsive style as well, which um, seems to be the new trend these days. <coughs> we also have St. John's. Um, St. John's is also working in responsive, but they chose to work with Epi for the usability factors, um, maybe like your guys yourselves as well, um, because they have, I think, seven, between seven and 9,000 community members in St. John's um, in their active directory that they want to be able to manage their own content in their own section of the site. So it was, it was key to them to allow those people to be able to, to, to manage that content. And it's like they actually, when, when looking for a CMS product, they actually got in a few of the, yeah, the most used CMS products around the world and they got eight or nine people to try it out. They got simple tasks, and they tried every uh, uh, CMS, and all of them selected EpiServer. Way! <laughs> no, but it, it, it is a very easy tool to use. Uh, we have Virgin Mobile across Australia. Um, Virgin's been an interesting case. Uh, we started off with a small project called Futurama, which was just for pure mobile, so they chose Epi for the mobile pack, basically so they could present their content across 20 different devices. Um, and they started using EpiServer so much that it's now become enterprise-wide application, and I think it's turned into a multi-multi-million dollar project, basically, just because they started working with it, they started liking it, and it just started expanding throughout um, version mobile, basically. Um, we also have JB Hi-Fi across Australia and New Zealand as well. So. Um, this site, JV Hi-Fi Home, um, was a concept site for them, so it was to get um, into Epi and to probably test it a little bit. So they built this uh, commerce site in, I think, eight weeks as a proof of concept to themselves. And since then, we've um, sort of developed into about eight or ten projects that are going to sort of unfold in the next 24 months, basically. It's got to be better than what we've got now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> terrible, <laughs> the existing site. So that, yeah. that's the next project that's kicking off soon is the JB Hi-Fi 
cool electronic side. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that side is not good right now. And they they're doing really really cool things. JB Hi-Fi. So they've just launched uh, a an ebook site, which is it's a soft launch, so they haven't done anything marketing here yet, uh, and it looks really good. I think one of the substantial um, features of this site is has access to over 20 million variations. So there's um, a lot of different books and different versions of books that are, um, are accessible through the site. Um, Fusion Retail, um, which own a collection of brands across New Zealand and Australia, such as Jag, Colorado, Diana, Ferrari, etc. Um, they were a similar situation to JB a little bit. They needed to rebrand and create the Colorado site before Christmas, so they built their site in, again, I think it was between eight and nine weeks, so they scoped it quite um, quite viciously to be able to get a transactional site out there, but it proved that the EpiServer um, platform could perform the functionality they needed to be able to uh, do commerce through the Christmas and sort of Christmas holiday period. And then from that base, they're now moving out to all their other brands and re-platforming their other brands and reskinning their other brands within sort of four or five weeks, basically. So they're getting a lot of return from um, the investment in there and then phasing out additional functionality as they need to. Richard, these sites, are they uh, their own developers or are they getting uh, like someone like Intergen to help them? Uh, someone like Intergen. But it's very important. Those, those tight deadlines, of course, are very, very scoped yeah. to be able to make them, but... Um, yeah, so the, the actual Colorado case, they, they, yeah, they needed to get out before Christmas, the Christmas shopping, because 80% of the, 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 a lot of their revenue comes from the Christmas. Uh, so they took all away, no campaigns, no anything before they just got out the transactional site, and then they've added in sort of in different steps of all the other functional. But it, it, was, it was very key for the client to have resources available. So they had architects, they had PMs that could champion it and get everything done when it needed to be done as well. And very interesting, if you, if you talk numbers for, for YAG, they launched not long ago, so it was after Christmas they launched. Uh, the Fusion Retail brand, they have a loyalty program across all their brands. So I think there's five brands in total. They have had 1.8 million members in the loyalty program at the end of last year or November. Now they have 2.3. That's 500,000 plus in, in a few months. And that's all, uh, it's not all thanks to EpiServer, of course, but they, they've changed the strategy a little bit also. Yeah. It allows them to be a lot more agile with promotions and, and content and social media and things like that. Uh, they started, well, they imported a lot of products, of course, but content, they started from fresh, basically. Just enough to get it there. But that, that, yeah, they, they, that it was a quick, they needed to get up. But they, they created a quick tool to be able to migrate um, all the product information. So is that um, maybe Service 7 would say the comments? Uh, no, it's no. actually Episode 6. six. Oh, yeah, sorry, Sunbeam. Yeah, so seven. it's Episode 6. <laughs> no, but because, yeah, they uh, they built Colorado. When was that launched? Yeah, at the same time as 7 was released, seven so was released. So yeah. they decided to go with 6. Uh, okay. Um, love my Roto. Um, so Rot Rottnest Island is an island uh, about an hour's trip from Perth. Has anyone been there? Rotness? It's a beautiful place. Um, so they wanted to... It is? They needed to bring more people to the island, basically. So they decided to create a community around the island. Um, it's been really successful for them. I think they started... How many members have they got now? Uh, a little bit more than 14,000, I think. I think, yeah, within a couple of months, they have 14,000 active members in their community, um, adding travel stories, videos, blogs about their experiences. Um, but their growth has been subjected to the loyalty program that they've built into the community. So if you put in a travel story, you might get 30 points, it might uh, cost 40 points for a free adult trip out to the island or something like that. Um, so that's kind of how they keep their activity going, I suppose. Uh, treasures, do you want to talk about treasures? Yeah, this is not really, a, yeah, I'm, I have two kids now, so I, I'm in the middle of this. <laughs> But this is a good New Zealand brand that runs on EpiServer, and I like it because they use all our products. 
So they have the CMS, of course, to, uh, uh, f to manage the content, but they also have the community. So they use our community product, and they have about I'm not sh a little bit more than 50,000 registered parents that go in there and talk about anything that concerns us. It doesn't have to be, uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, diapers or nappies, uh, other things as well. And that you can actually buy the products online as well. Not that it's many different variations or SKUs, but you, you can, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a vibrant community. And it's a good, uh, so the, the company behind this, Treasures, is called SCA. They've taken this uh, uh, setup and they've launched in other markets. So there's an, a similar setup in Malaysia, Singapore, I think South Africa as well. Not as successful as here in New Zealand, but it's, it, it's a good example. Okay. And finally, but not least, we have uh, Osterio. So Osterio um, run all the radio stations across Australia. Um, so we have a couple of the existential sites called Triple M and also uh, Two Day FM um, that have gone live within the last couple of months or so. Um, they have a massive requirement around sharing, pushing out content and media performance, pretty much pushing EpiServer to its limit. So it's, it's a great um, study for what EpiServer is able to do from that perspective, I suppose. Yeah. So it's one of our more enterprise um, clients, I suppose. Okay. All right, so let's look a little bit more about EpiServer specifically, um, around EpiServer 7.1, which was released of weeks ago. Um, so one of the focuses between <coughs> 6 and 7, um, I think I'm right to presume you guys are all working on 6, 6R2, six is that is about right? 5, 6. Okay, cool. So we're all familiar with EPI anyway. <laughs> but one of the key focuses between, um, well, moving into 7 was simplicity. So. As you guys might know, working in five and six, there's a lot of different ways of working with content. You have the on-screen edit, you have the back edit mode, you've got Composer if you want to drag and drop components around, uh, things like that. So there's a key focus on making that very simple, very easy to use, focusing on the content um, rather than how you'd be working with the content. Um, so the user experience was very key um, for content authors, uh, merchandisers, marketing executives, etc. working with working with EP server. So, we have a strong UX team um, in EpiServer working on the product that were are working around a minimalistic idea, user-centric, uh, focusing on content, so making it easier for you guys to, to do what you're trying to, trying to achieve, basically, and a lot of attention to all the little details. So a lot of the little details sum up to make um, lives a, little, a lot easier, I suppose. Um, our product uh, delivery team look at the user journey when thinking about the roadmap of EpiServer. Um, so what um, you guys are trying to achieve, what you're trying to get out of your customers or visitors coming to your site, what goals and what conversions you're trying to get them to perform basically. So a part of that user journey is getting visible. So how do you guys get visible? Do you do work through social, multiple channels? Um, if it's through in-store kiosks, if it's mobile, um, if it's um, native apps, etc. Um, how do you work with search? Um, do we need to provide you great SEO tools to ensure that you're there in Google? Um, things like that. Then of course, um, it might be about getting trusted. So for example, on the commerce sites, people are more likely to convert and buy products if they can see ratings, they can see reviews, they can see where people similar to themselves have used the products and get a feel for the products, rather than just seeing one or two photos of it online, for example. Um, of course, with blogs, polls, um, all, that, all that sort of stuff. And uh, rich media and context-driven context personalization. So it's becoming more and more user-centric now. Uh, people want to see content that's specific to them. Um, so we can present information that's relevant to them to help them find what they're looking for quicker and ultimately help them convert. Um, yeah, of course, yeah, what the site's there to convert, basically. So it might be various actions that are specific to you guys. It might be purchasing a product, completing a form, downloading a document, um, sign up for a membership, something like that. Okay. Um, keeping in touch is important, so creating the bi-directional um, feedback or, or the loyalty loop, I suppose. Um, so being able to send out um, social messages, being able to send out personalized emails based on history of, of, of 
where they've been and where they've moved through your site and create that loyalty. So re-engage them, make them come back to your site, make them spend more time on your site to um, increase those conversions again. So these are the kind of things that um, our product delivery team look at and try to fit into every server um, when deciding what goes into the roadmap. So that's what brings us into um, our new positioning. So EpiServer is around digital marketing and e-commerce, I suppose. So it's about uniting them together. So inside digital marketing, we have the CMS, of course. We have tools to work with SEO, social, um, community. And then we have the commerce platform as well. And together, we have a unique customer experience. So it's possible on EpiServer to be able to create social commerce sites, etc., be able to easily work with promotions, be able to easily personalize content or products from commerce and community as well. And that's what makes us um, quite unique. Um, but one of our key strengths, I suppose, is one platform that might contain several products, but those products are designed to work together from both the user's perspective um, and also the developer's perspective. So it makes you more agile, it makes, gives you the ability to, to build what you really want to build. So Service 7 is around creating innovative solutions for multi-channel e-commerce and digital marketing. Um, so some of the key features um, or focuses inside 7. Um, it sort of was introduced a little bit in 6R2 and that's content targeting or personalization. And it's going to take a step further um, in the next release of EpiServer as well. So we want to be able to personalize our content. We want to be able to push to people what they're interested in, what they're seeing, um, to ultimately help them convert. So for example, we might want to work with, or we need to work with anonymous visitors. We also might have registered information. So we might have information about our visitors um, through CRM as well. So it brings up the question, what do we know about our visitors? What can we do? What can we personalize? So if, if we're anonymous, um, we know how they found us, so how they came to the site, where they came from. Do they come from Google? Were they searching for something specific? Um, do they come from a competitor site, for example? Um, do they come from Facebook? Do they come from our Twitter post that we just pushed out? Um, their history with you, so we know if they've, they've previously visited the site, if they've come back, what pages they walked through, did they look at a couple of products, have they looked at um, some documents, have they downloaded anything, etc. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of looks at the behaviour on the site a little bit. How many times they've come back, what they've looked at, what they've what they've done, what actions they've performed on your site, um, the context of where they are, what they're doing, etc. Um, and again, we might have various profile or various information that we've captured about them, um, information that's sitting inside the CRM, etc. Again, um, Rotnest Express, um, the ferry service out to Rotnest Island that we mentioned earlier. They have a massive wealth of information about everybody that travels on their boats. Um, so who they travel with, if they hire anything, what ports they go to, what time of the day they went to the ports, all that sort of information. So whenever they come to the site or come to the community, it's highly personalized um, if, if they're return visitors. So for example, if they know they went to the far port on the, the end side of the island, for example, they might want to say, why don't you try this port over here? We know, we know you hired a surfboard, so here's the surf report for today. There's better surf over here. Do you want to hire a bicycle for 30% off to be able to get to this beach or something like that? Um, so it allows you to do some cross-selling and up-selling as well. And of course, multi-screen. Um, it seems to be some of the, some of the buzzwords and, and stuff going on at the moment. Um, so we want to use a multi-screens, mobile, tablet, desktop. Um, we want to be able to instant, instantly preview it before it's pushed out. We want to see what we're doing, see what we're changing, etc. And that's what EpiServer 7 allows you to do. <coughs> so um, we want to work with responsive, or we might want individual content for different channels as well. But it's, it's more than just multi-screen as well. Um, it's multi-channel or touch points or <coughs> what, whatever you call it or whatever Forrester or Gartner report you read from. So you might want to share your content across social, you might want to share it across native apps, you might want to use it inside emails, promotions, um, install kiosks all over the place basically. Okay. Social media as well. We want to be able to manage um, our social content or things that we push out in one place. We want to be able to share it, we want to be able to personalize it. Um, we want real-time statistics, we want to know that people are clicking on um, our Facebook post, that they're liking it, that they're adding comments to it, etc. Get some feedback, um, work with Google Analytics as well. 
um, and we want to be able to control it. We want one centralized place that we can just push out our content to our multiple channels. And of course, feedback. Um, we want, I think the advantages of working with EpiServer and analytics is it's, it's very easy to use. Um, it's very easy to be able to create um, paths and KPIs to start measuring um, some of the conversions and, and see what people are doing and the behavior on the sites. So be able to get an easy overview, work with Google Analytics, work across different channels, be able to see what channels are performing, performing better, and ultimately measure um, any conversions through the site. Perform A-B tests, um, multivariable optimization on components on the pages, etc. Um, we've introduced the concept of add-ons inside EpiServer, so we'll talk about more of, more of this in the second session, but the idea is to allow you guys to be a little bit more, more agile in the sense that um, any functionality or any plugins that you might want um, or might need straight away, so it might be something simple like um, a more advanced skull checker or something like that, that you can install through the add-on store yourself inside the CMS. So the CMS can subscribe to feeds, maybe EpiServer feeds, third-party feeds, um, feeds from Intigen, for example, that might contain plugins or packages in there that you can install yourselves. So it has one click install. We have certified add-ons as well. So um, there's a level of, of, of guarantee around the quality, quality of them. You might have an enterprise store in the future where you can, we can purchase plugins and things like that as well. Okay, so that's enough PowerPoint. Um, enough PowerPoint, yeah. <laughs> let's, um, let's look at episode uh, 7.1. Does anyone have any questions? Um, I do. We're, we're just moving from four. Gone through five, and we're stepping through to six. So I tell you for yep. our intranet site, and so and we've already upgraded our internet site. Um, so both have been heavily developed originally in the four or five. How easy is it to start to bring in these new components on a on a site that was originally built on the older technologies? Do you understand what I mean? Uh, like, yeah, you're going to want the community to relate. Sorry, sorry, there. Sorry. Like, so, are we better off building the templates from scratch again to get the new functionality? Or are we better just to do an in place upgrade like we've just done? Yeah, uh, yeah, so the add on store only works on 7. Oh, I'm not, not okay. worried about that. It's like we're, we're moving forward, yeah. but there's all these new things that are available now mm. that we've developed. Outside originally on the old yep. platform. Mm -hmm. yep. How is it easy to um, start if we went to seven? Mm -hmm. Start integrating the new features <coughs> on something that was developed using the old old infrastructure. Uh, I suppose it depends on the component itself. Like for example, social reach, which we'll look at shortly to push out messages to social channels. That's more of an add-on to the CMS that you can start using, I suppose. But when it comes to maybe multi-channel, etc., you during the upgrade you may not start taking advantage of the fact that you can have multiple renders or templates or presentations for different channels, um, or you'll see that we can easily drag and drop content around <coughs> pages and, and things like that. So it'll be there and you can use it inside Seven. But to take advantage of some of the the new components and bits and pieces, you might need to do a little bit more work. But at the same time, there might be other tools there that you can start using straight away because they're not 100% specific on your solution. So would you recommend to a, a client that you've used this for the last five years, maybe you should start redesigning using the new environment or just try and fudge it into the environment that you've got now? Um, yeah, I think... I think I think it's pro it probably warrant having some sort of discovery type discussion talk to see what you've got and what you want to achieve and what you could achieve and things like that. I'm just seeing things like we've got a mobile, Al goes mobile, yep. but uh, we've configured that ourselves using JavaScript and mm -hmm. other things. Whereas uh, now it looks like you that's built in within the EpiServer 7 to be able to go to these different platforms easily. Mm -hmm. So we have to almost strip out what we've done and try to go, or is it easier to just redesign how, how we, you know. It, it could be easier to redesign it. <laughs> yeah, especially as we're going to look at integrating mm -hmm. some of the social functionality and, um, and yeah, you know, just be easier to rethink everything rather than 
try and find okay. stuff that yeah. we've kind of come along. It's probably, given we're looking at the social media yeah. functionality, yeah. it's probably the perfect time yeah. to look at whether what path we do take in terms of that long-term strategy, whether we take stock and upgrade, take advantage of some of the additional functionality or where we can, yeah. or where we can do some other ones now and then um, upgrade later. Yeah. Especially because we haven't done a lot of development in six yet. Like we've only just yeah. gone to six, and so it's yeah. kind of that time where we're thinking about the actual templates need a bit of a rethink, and, mm -hmm. and the way we want to present information needs a rethink. So rather than just go ahead and start monkeying with what we've got, I think we better sit stand back and Part of the digital methodology, though, the, the developers will consciously be aware mm -hmm. of the upgrade path as they develop the application, yeah. taking aware of the version changes so that the code doesn't have to be a complete reboot when yeah. you move to a completely different version. So as long as you're in check with that process of what the future state will look like and what the future version will look like, the developers will take that into account during the, during the coding. I think we're in a situation where because we've had a long history of using it so we can just upgrade them over time. We've got a lot of legacy code that we're dragging around with us. We've kind of painted ourselves into the corner, I guess, to some extent. So, yeah, there is a case to say maybe we should stop and just start being emotionally There may be some components that you can reuse or refactor yeah. a little bit to save a bit of time. Oh, I'm sure there's stuff that we could some of the code that's in there, you know, at the time we had to write custom code to do it, and now just yeah. Okay, so uh, who, who here has seen seven before? Just in the last one. Oh yeah, Henrik. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's have a look at seven. So we're going to use a site that's called Alloy. It's just a fictitious company site, basically. Um, it has a couple of product pages in here, maybe uh, some article pages, um, various event listings, etc. So it's just a simple site for us to sort of present some of the, the features of Happy Super, basically. Okay. So I should still be logged into the site, we'll find out in a second, um, which means I have an EPServer tab on, on the top right hand corner of the browser. So one thing you guys might notice is there's no right click menus anymore. Everything is sort of one or two or three clicks away, basically, and, and very direct and, and on the page. So I have the option up here to go straight into my dashboard, or I can go straight into my edit view and start working with content straight away. Um, so I'll do that, click on the little pencil. So we're now in edit mode now. So everything's been united together to give us one easy way of working with content. So you can see the content areas we have, we can start working on them straight away. So for example, in the title, um, this may long, no longer be new anymore. We might just get rid of that. And okay, I'm on a previous version. That's not a good example. <laughs> um, let's just go to another one. Alloy track. Let's make this one new instead. There we go. <laughs> um, so we, we get direct feedback, we can make the changes direct on the page. Um, any sort of content areas um, on here that might involve sort of the WASIWI editor, etc., panel open on the right hand side, and we can start working with the content in there. We can work in full screen mode, etc. Um, so it, it provides a really easy, nice way of working might notice that every time we make a change, um, each individual change is auto-saved as well. So we can roll back each individual change, revert back to the previously pub published version as well. It also means we have um, something that we call a common drawer. So if other people log into the site, start working on the same piece of content, um, the content will be locked um, naturally. But then th if they start working on the content, all the changes will be synced between the, between the editors working on that content as well. Um, so perhaps we should create a new page um, and go through that, that process. So on the left hand side we have a panel that appears. So we still have um, the tree structure in here that, that maps to our, our structure or our content. Um, so we'll create a new page uh, in here. So we have a list of the available types of pages that we can create and of course we can filter them um, based on access rights, permissions, um, the section of the site we're working on. 
CMS7 also suggests page types that are relevant to, to the user as well. So we'll create a new uh, product page to start with. Uh, let's keep it consistent, so we call it oops, Family Chat. Okay, so it's asking us to complete um, any required fields that we have. So there's a great validation framework in here now, so we can put in a lot of custom messages, custom rules into any fields that um, need to be completed or any sort of um, validation that, that we'd like to put in there. So we'll just say something like, hello chat. It's really easy to use. Okay, done. So now we have our new page. Um, we can start putting in content in there. So maybe I'll just copy some out of a document to get going. Um, I should probably mention as well that we can publish directly from Word into EpiServer as well. Oops. Okay, let's just get some body. Okay. Okay, so on the right hand side we have another panel that opens up and that's where we have our file manager and we can work with files, create directories, upload files, um, edit images, um, work in different repositories, etc. So we might add some images in here but we'll create a new directory first. Um, what should we call it? Uh, let's just create one for Alloy Chat. In here. Um, so we'll select a couple of images maybe. So we can easily perform uploads in, in multiple browsers, etc. Oh, I didn't put it in the right place, but the idea. Okay, you can see that this site is responsive. So I'm trying to work with a little resolution here. <laughs> um, just bring it out. We'll just drag a lot of chat directly into there, if we like. Um, we also have some content areas in here where we can drag and drop other pieces of content. So it might be blocks of content, it might be other pages um, that we have existing inside the site. So for example, um, we might have some events or other items of content we want to promote on here. So maybe in the events we want to drag on an event we want to reuse. So it's very easy to reuse content if we like. Um, we can move it over to the right hand side. And the idea is the presentation will look after itself, I suppose. It doesn't matter where the content's coming from within the CMS, um, it will present it correctly for you. So you might want to bring in a couple of other events as well, if you like. So you'll notice that everything sort of reformats and reshapes itself a little bit, no matter how many items um, that we put in there. So we've added a couple of events on here, which might be okay, but it might also be um, a better idea if we present the event that creates um, a better conversion, I suppose. So we want people to sign up to the event, so we might want to present only the event that more people sign up to, basically. So to be able to do that, we can create what we call... Um, just, a, just ask a question, yeah. sorry. So when you're dragging that in, you're just basically creating a, a reference to that piece of content, you're not duplicating it. No. So that's the single source and we're just using it wherever you want to. Yeah, so in the site we're just we're telling it to pull out the title, the introduction and the preview image and that's it. So it's referencing it, I suppose. Yeah. It's not creating we're a making new copy of it. Okay, so we want to create uh, what we call a self-optimizing block and that will present um, the best event based on the conversion rate. Okay. So to be able to do that, over on the right hand side we have a section called blocks and blocks are smaller components of content that we would like to reuse um, throughout the site, I suppose. So it might be general content, again it might be events, it might be contact information, it might be Google Maps, it might be images, it might be um, documents that have been encapsulated into a block, it might be videos, etc. <coughs> so let's just create maybe a new folder in here um, for <coughs> our chat. Okay, and we'll create a new block. So we'll create a new self-optimizing block and we'll call it um, events for our chat. Okay, so we need to um, create a goal page um, so we can sort of get an idea of the conversion, I suppose. So we might select um, the thank you page. Um, 
which is presented once um, a registration has been completed, I suppose. So we'll just drag that in there. So that becomes our goal. So we can drag and drop any components of content in here that we want to present um, randomly, and then this block will figure out which one to present more often based on um, the user <laughs> converting and going through to that thank you page. So <coughs> we'll drag. Came out from Australia. Yes. <laughs> I need one of those hats with corks on it. <laughs> okay, so we've just dragged in our three events, and that's giving us some basic information. So it's telling us the proportion of visitors that are going to see um, that content. There's no conversions yet, um, and, and how well it performs compared to the other components of content. So we'll publish this block um, so we can use it, and we'll go back to the page that we're working on and pull it out of our library. So we'll now put that in here, and we'll remove these ones. Okay. So now only that, so that block is now going to present um, the the optimum event, basically, I suppose, the most the most popular event. Okay. All right. So maybe we'll add a few more components to our page to make it a little bit more useful. So. For example, by type, we might want to add in a sign-up form on the right-hand side um, to sign up to a new product or a new event or, or something like that as well. Um, we might want to put in some contact information, so let's just go back to Hello Chat, create a new block again. Um, let's create a new contact block, it's contact information, um, so contact, which is Okay, so in here we can put in our content for our contact block. Um, so, what am I put, please, contact information, etc. And in here we can select the contact. Okay, I'm not in there, but this might be coming from some sort of repository of um, contact information, etc. So it can populate it for us. Um, we might want to drag um, another image in there. Yikes. So um, I could resize it, but I won't, I won't go through all of that. But you can see that we're previewing the block in different widths, and that's because we can drag this block into different locations or different templates in the site. So we're previewing it on every possible view, I suppose, that it's, that it's going to be looked or seen as. Um, so we can preview it and, and see what it's going to look like. So if we publish our content block again so we can use it, so blocks are published independently to pages because if we drag this block onto 10 pages, we can update it in one central place, essentially. Go back to our page, um, blocks. So Rich, are you saying that you put the block onto a page and it works out which is the best of those formats to yeah. on that page? Yeah. Yeah. So you just that dragged it up there, if you drag it down to the... Yeah. It's, it's yeah. about the same. If I maybe if I move that one out, let's change it a little bit. Yeah. So in terms of your image sizes, do you put in a? Do you know what your maximum width is for what? Or would you? I mean, so you put in a certain size of image, and then that will basically do the resizing for you. Just thinking about page loading and the size of image. Yeah. So when you're doing this stuff. It's not so much about the size of the image; it's about the proportion of the image. So it's going to change the size depending on what it's rendering. Right. So it actually serves up just the constraint. Yep. Um, so we might add one more final block, um, some sort of promotion that we want to put on our new product, and we might want to present this promotion only to a specific um, group of visitors. So maybe people that have visited several product pages that have returned to the site 10 times in the last month or something like that, that we want to give them 20% off to help them convert, basically. So to be able to do that, um, we want to personalize it. And to be able to personalize it, we need to create what we call a visitor group. So visitor groups and personalization were introduced in 6R2. Um, and we've continued it in 7, of course, and it's going to take another step further um, in the next release, which we'll talk about um, in the next session. But we want to create a visitor group or a persona of um, visitor, I suppose, that we can then reflect that content on. So to be able to do that, um, we need to go into visitor groups. 
inside the CMS, and this presents all the groups that we've previously created. We can delete them, manage them, um, refresh the statistics, etc. But we'll we'll create a new one. Um, so we'll create a group called um, maybe interested in products, for example. So we define our visitor group based on a collection of criteria that we have on the right hand side and we drag and drop the criteria across to build up our group um, that reflects the visitor or the type of visitor that comes to the site. So it may be based on anonymous information or it may be based on registered um, information that we have about the user. So we might have, for example, visited category, drag that in here. So we can categorize our content, of course, so if we select a category, um, LO Plan, which is one of our products, so if they viewed um, four out of the six pages that had been tagged with LO Plan, then they belong to that group. Uh, we might want a number of visits as well, so if we say more than five visits in total or within the last maybe two days or, or two weeks, for example. Um, we might want to select specific pages um, that they visited um, inside the site. We might want to pull information out of their profile, so if their email address contains um, EpiServer, we might want to present them some specific content. Um, the language that they're viewing in, the number of pages, I've well, talked about that. Um, we might have the browser, the role that they're sitting inside, um, time and place criteria, so maybe what location they're viewing the site from, um, if we select New Zealand, if we're viewing it from Wellington, for example, um, time of day, um, we might want to show you some different information in the, in the morning versus the evening, etc. Um, URL criteria is quite powerful as well, so um, if they search for specific keywords on Google, um, if they've come from specific URLs and landed on your site, or if they've landed on a specific page, etc. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of criteria that are available out of the box, um, and it's possible for you to create your own custom criteria as well that might talk to your CRM or some information that you have about your visitors. Okay. Um, so we'll just remove that one. We can apply some, some rules as well, so we can choose how we match the criteria. We can match all of them, we can match any of them, or we can also associate points to them as well. So we can say some criteria are required, but we mainly want one or two criteria to, to need to be true. So we'll save our group, and we'll go back to our page, sitting down here. So we'll go to our promotion, click our promotion, select personalize. We can select um, our group, okay? And now that block is only going to be pre presented to visitors that match that group. Okay. So what will show if you're not from that group? Do you have a, an alternate, or would you just have a at the moment, they'll see what we're looking at now. Nothing. But you, yeah, you, have you can have fallback. You can just go. Yeah. But how we set it up now is that it won't show that block. Yeah. yeah. So we can and, and it you see it automatically resizes depending on. Yeah. So so that the actual user can focus on converting, not how the site looks like. So we can preview the page um, within the CMS rather than having to jump out. But of course, we can still jump out to view mode, so to speak. Um, it's, it's sticky as well, which means we can move through the site and, and preview the site. And we have a couple of options when we're previewing or working with content as well. One of those is the visitor group. So we can preview the page or the site based on the visitor groups that we've created. So if we have uh, interest in products, select the group. Um, you can see we now see the winter promotion because we're viewing um, the content or working with the page based on that visitor group, I suppose. Okay. If I select none, we can do the same for language, so we can flip over various languages, and we also have channels as well. So this is where we can work with multiple channels, whether it's mobile, kiosk, native apps, Facebook channel, etc. So we can flip it over to mobile, and we can preview it and start working on it based on the different devices that we're, we're supporting. So. We can work with content in exactly the same way. We can select the content, we can edit it, um, etc. We can preview it and move through the site if we want to. Um, and yeah, it's pretty cool. Let's go back to the page. So we might have different resolutions. For example, we might <coughs> check it on the iPad. We get rid of the previewing. We can edit it on the iPad, Android. 
So you guys can define your channels and, and what resolutions, essentially. So you might want Microsoft Surface tablet in there as well. Um, you might have some on-site kiosk or, or something like that. You might have native apps that you're pushing content out so you can preview it um, and work on it in, in that view, basically. Are these uh, select things? Pardon? You can define what OS you're using. So you had four there, and you can sort of say, right, you can, we've, got, we've now got um, Microsoft Surface available, mm -hmm. so you can add that to your... Oh yeah, that's a, yeah, that, yeah, that's a resolution, yeah. yeah so it, that, that's a resolution. But what, what, what yeah, how, how are the resolutions being defined? In a config, isn't it? <laughs> it's in a config file. So when iPad launches its iPad large next year, whatever, it, they've come up with, you can just in a config file add another resolution there mm -hmm. but what's the cool thing is the channels I think that adds another I, I'll, I'll give you an example of what's it called here it's countdown isn't it the equivalent to Woolworth in Australia yeah, an equivalent to that is called co-op in Norway they have the the campaign with the, it's called a, sort of a ten dollar campaign you can buy dinner for ten dollars for the whole family they have that in Norway they do the push out to the different sort of social things and on their website and they do paper campaigns as well to get people into the store. So that's one channel, the, the web and the social, <coughs> the web and social, that's two campaign uh, channels. Then they actually get into the store and they go to the kiosks. That's another channel. And then they have that week's campaign. They click on the campaign, it's, it prints the grocery list and in the right order as well. So you go through the store, you get all the groceries, you get to the counter, they actually have now, so you can actually scan the things with your phone, which is another channel on your app there. Scan it, and you can pay it via your account. So you can actually show that you've paid it when you walk out the, 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 the actual store. When you get home, you take the same campaign and you put it on your iPad, which is a, yet another channel, and you get the recipe. There. So you can cook the things that you've just bought. That's just a good example of following through the different channels, the same kind of content. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Let's go back to automatic. Um, maybe it's a good idea to publish our page. So um, everything is very context driven as well. So the, the various messages that appear, et cetera, will all change depending on the context of the page and, and what's going on with the page as well. So we haven't published it yet, so we'll publish it, we can schedule it for publishing, we can kick start workflows, um, all, all that functionality is, is still there. Um, I should probably mention as well, we have the forms editing as well, so we can still work in, in the sort of tabbed um, fashion and it, it doesn't always make sense to change content or some properties directly on the page anyway. So we've still got all those, um, all those fields sitting inside there as well. Exactly, you can start the workflows, and there's a lot of other set settings at the back end. So that's, yeah, I think you recognize these features from, but it's not in your face when you work with the actual content, but you can get there. Okay, so maybe let's just move that up a little bit. Okay, so now we've created our page, we've got a form on it, we have a self-optimizing block, etc. So it would probably make sense to push it out um, to get some get some visitors to the page. So to be able to do that, we can use a tool that we call um, Social Reach, and it allows us to share our page with the social channels that we've defined. So if we click on here. <coughs> um, so in here we can create a new message, and we can select the various social channels that we've predefined, um, and it will push that message for us out to the different channels. And then it will give us some basic feedback, so who liked it, who clicked on it, etc. We can track it with Google Analytics to get some more information back as well. So we might just um, select an image on here as well. Does that come as uh, standard, or is that a plugin that you need to purchase the social, social uh, It's a free plugin. Free plugin. Yeah, yeah. Six, or was that just for seven? Uh, actually, it was, it was first built on six, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you can do it on six, yeah. Yep. Um, so we can put in a campaign name if we want to track it with um, GA. We can I'll schedule look. it to go out at a certain look. time if we like as well. Um, maybe let's just shrink it a bit. We can put in specific messages for um, 
each, <coughs> each channel as well, if we like. Um, but we'll just click. So let's send it out. So we have a list of previous messages that we've sent out. If we just go into it quickly so we can see what we've sent. Um, and we've got some basic stats in here. We can click on go to um, to see what it looks like on our Twitter feed. Um, so that's what we sent out basically. Um, so we can click on that and go back into the site. But before we do that, um, I'm going to set up um, a KPI. Um, inside our analytics so we can get some feedback and, and see what's going on a little bit as well. So if we go um, back into the CMS, okay, um, we'll go into CMO, which is our campaign management um, and optimization tool. So it allows us to create um, KPIs against actions like completing forms, um, viewing pages, being referred from various sites, um, A-B testing, etc. So I'll go in there and create a new campaign for our page and set up a KPI for completing our form that we, we added onto our page. So let's create um, a new campaign. So we'll call it chat. So this is now a part of the CMS as opposed to being additional in the previous versions of the server. And that makes way for what's coming out on the roadmap shortly. <laughs> So we'll add a couple of pages on here. Um, I like chats. Maybe. Et cetera. So we'll create a KPI for our chat page. So we'll select form. Um, that's the form that we added to our page. So. Uh, Um, for each value um, that the form is um, submitted, um, we'll give it uh, a value of 1 and we want um, to sort of achieve 10 um, form submissions, I suppose. So we'll add that on there. Um, we can create a conversion path as well. Um, so we might want to see where people are coming or create various paths that we might think that people might take to get to our product page. Um, so we'll say view. Um, oh, chat from start page. Let's put in our start page. Hello, chat, etc. So we just save our campaign. So now we've saved our campaign and it's going to start measuring the core analytics. It's going to start measuring the KPI that we set on the form and also the conversion path that we set as well. So if we look at um, just quickly. A previous, whoops, a previous campaign. So we, we can have a look at what it might look like. So we might have some basic statistics such as unique visitors, returning visitors, the average time they spend on those pages, their browsers, etc. Um, the KPI values themselves, uh, maybe conversion path. So we can see um, what proportion of people went through the various steps in the path, how much time they spent on them what number of visitors left at certain pages, we can get the URLs um, and, and things like that. Okay. So if we go back here, <coughs> click on our link, go back to our page, let's submit our form, let's do Andres. Thanks. Yeah, I don't want any spam. <laughs> actually work for whatever reason but we'll, we'll keep going and have a look anyway. Um, so if we now go to our dashboard, so inside our dashboard we can add uh, gadgets of course that you, you might be familiar with. Um, so the gadgets might be various tools, various reports and information. Um, we have a Google Analytics gadget that's available so you can um, view specific analytics from Google as well as our own analytics from CMO. Um, so you can choose the information you'd like to view from Google. 
So if we go into graphs and lists, for example, we can start measuring our visitor groups as well. So that visitor group that we um, previously created um, interested in products, we can oh, click OK. Sorry, Richard. The Google Analytics plugin, does that put a lot of load on the server if it's going off? We've got lots of people doing stuff, you know, looking at analytics while they're sort of. Um, Other people I, might be editing the site or whatever. I mean, I don't know if it's our infrastructure, but sometimes our, it can be quite slow, which is probably our infrastructure. But um, and when you're in editing, say within the CMS, so if you've got the analytics package as well, kind of in there doing stuff. Analytics is on the Google side. No, but if you're <coughs> pulling it into, so does it have any effect on actual CMS while you're doing stuff? If you're pulling into that as a gadget, is it or is it just? Oh, it's infrastructure. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard of anyone having trouble yeah. using it. I mean, you can tell Google sure. Analytics to, to not track you if you're an editor and things like that. Right. As well. Because you don't necessarily want that to skew your results or anything as well. Um, but for example, we can add a gadget on here, um, maybe the KPI summary um, and campaign statistics as well. Might just rearrange them. So we can then select our KPI. So our load chat, um, we've got our forms KPI on here. Um, so we can choose what information we're interested in, in doing basically, and we can compare it against um, GA. We can select our campaign or select event, so we've actually got some information in there. Um, yeah. So the idea of the dashboard is you can select what information you're interested in and you can sort of preview it, I suppose, directly in there. Okay, okay. Um, so the final um, aspect I'd like to show you in here uh, is the add-ons, which we briefly mentioned earlier. So the add-ons allow you to install various plugins um, into the CMS yourself, so it gives you a bit more agility. Um, it allows you to update them as well. So for example, our latest release 7.1, which has a few UI improvements, you can actually update it through here um, rather than performing a release directly on the server, I suppose. So if we look at EpiServer, the beta feed, so the idea is EpiServer will have um, feeds with um, certified plugins. Um, you can subscribe to other feeds and you might have a feed with various plugins in there as well. There might be third party plugins, um, there might be developer plugins that you use at your own risk, etc. For example, the Google Analytics, the social reach which we've used, um, I installed it through the, the add-ons inside here. There's the publishing from Office as well. Um, so that's just some examples of the store. So it allows you to have one-click install, one-click update as well. Um, yeah. So what do you guys think? <coughs> um, but that that's that's seven in a nutshell, really. Yeah, that's a quick. <laughs> Quick overview. And there are these really cool smarts as well. So go back to edit on one page. So we, also, you know, the the properties as we call it uh, that you have uh, that you can go to the form view of the page. Really click. Can I get that? Sorry for. And these kind of nice features. There is something moving there. You, you haven't published, so it's pretty obvious that you haven't published. So if I just I just publish this quickly, but you can you can go to this specific page in the form view, and you recognize this. We've collected all the most important sort of properties up here in the gray area, or whatever color it is. You can actually access that just by scrolling. So I'm now scrolling, so you can actually ac access those things just by scrolling up. So though there are a few of those nice little features just to make life easier for the, the actual editor. So the editor should focus on creating good content so that you actually can achieve your targets, which you are measuring via your KPIs to get conversions, whatever conversion is in your organization. They shouldn't be focusing on if the text looks good or they should, yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, the look and feel. It should, a good CMS should just take care of that, if it makes sense. So <clears throat> you talked about supporting responsive design. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that largely a function of how you create your page types? I mean, it kind of appeared like EpiServer is automatically resizing everything for you. Is that it's, the case? It's the CSS. But you have to write, create your page type in a way that allows it to do that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
five to six seven years. No, no, <laughs> no. You still have to. So I'm wondering, what is it that that CMS seven is adding, bringing to the party that we wouldn't have with the previous version? Responsive is simply an option, I suppose. So, of course, you can preview it, and it will force it to flip over because it uses a different resolution. But if you don't, if you don't want to use responsive, you might want um, independent content for different channels. So, for example, in mobile, the context typically changes quite a lot. So, you may not want to present all the same content. You might want just the heading, just the main body, but you might want to put a store locator on there instead of two thousand products or something like that. Right. Um, so you can have you can have independent templates showing independent content or functionality for different channels as well. Responsive is just one option, I suppose. And yes, responsive is the CSS. The CMS allows you to preview it and edit it based on those resolutions as well. So could you set it up so that on your page template or whatever you've got set up, that you might have say a long heading for desktop version and then a shorter heading for when you display mobile, and that it can be smart enough to know what you want to serve up yeah. in terms of so the content. The, C the CMS knows when whatever so channels like, you've defined as active, so you, okay. and then it can present different content depending on how you've implemented those channels. Right. So you might want um, you might want the introduction to disappear because it takes up half your screen on the iPhone, for example. Yeah. Or have uh, uh, one property that is only visible on mobile phones, like the contact us property, where you have a little button or whatever it is that pops up pretty early in the uh, high up in the on the actual iPhone. So in terms of layout, you could sort of almost change it depending, like you say, on the mobile Yes, you can have completely independent templates. Yeah, the same sort of content. Yeah. That wouldn't be the same. Yeah. Yeah. The CMS will use them depending on what channel is active. Yeah. And it figures out dynamically what channel is active. We have, we have uh, uh, editor trainings. We have that. Uh, we have those scheduled. Uh, it's uh, it, it is yeah. We have done. Uh, it's not scheduled courses, but we have done and it's actually successfully. Uh, I think it's a case study on our website for Variety in Australia. So they have editors spread out. So that it was just would have cost them a fortune to send everyone to one. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we d we did. Uh, it's uh, I think it's three times, no, two times three hours. So you spread it out on two days. And there's one person from Episerver doing that. So there are uh, sort of walks, but they have individual exercises and things like that. We have done that. It's just not scheduled. It's on a, we, uh, yeah, the, yeah. We don't do technical. We've tried that to do web technical training, but it's, we can't guarantee good. It's just difficult to do over online. More yeah, yeah. There's also administrative training as well. Oh, yeah, and merchandise training as well for commerce. No, absolutely. Is X form still around, or do you have something better? <laughs> Very good question. That's uh, for you. No. <laughs> you keep it in the box. Uh, it's still around, but that is something that is gonna change pretty Has soon. Has it improved? Sure. No, you just you just saw it. <laughs> no. No. it it's um it's gonna yeah. There's, it's on the roadmap um in the next I'm, I'm within, not too within, sure actually. No, it's within this year calendar. Year. Yeah. But it's uh yeah, that's a pretty common question that we get that you but it's still uh, X form. So the new thing, is that going to be a plugin, or is that part of a new, new version of CMS that's coming in? Um, it'll be released um, through the add-on store as an EP server plugin. Um, yeah, it won't be charged. And it's, yeah. yeah. Um, how does it handle recurring events in Calendar? Does it handle in the same way as Microsoft Outlook? Like, um, for example, say an event should occur every month, um, say on 
second second Monday of every month. So does it handle automatically, or do we have to write a custom code for them? Recurring events. Uh, events are traditionally made through template work, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, but you can present events from different repositories if you like. There's scheduled jobs, so you can write functionality in there that do recurring bits and pieces and things like that. But for example, I mean. There's basics, uh, there's basic subscriptions and scheduling and, and things like that as well, but it's typically template work. So is that events um, section part of the relate to a community package, or is that just... This, this section here? Yeah. These are just demo They're templates. CMS. CMS. Yeah. So we are That's on the bit CMS. Um, I suppose you should mention that there's a lot more sort of in-depth events inside the community package. Does, so it, does it handle surveys? Does, does it survey about survey? Uh, only what's supplied using X forms, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something. Yeah, you you would like. Yeah, I know the what you mean. The the yeah, if they answer yes, poll. here go. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Community contains polls as well which is a bit more specific for larger audiences, I suppose. No, but the more advanced service, no. Uh, now that you're tracking who's coming in and things like that, one of our main problems was uh, make sure the page didn't come up again for a returning person, so we had to put a token onto the person's machine so that we know that they've been there before but now you're monitoring IP addresses and things like that I suppose. So you yeah. know that, that person's been there before so that they you can um you can apply the person the personalization doesn't have to be applied just to a block. You can apply it to sections of the site, the whole <laughs> site, little individual words if you want to as well. So you could say that a whole section of the site is only available to returning yeah, visitors just, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so you can set yeah, you can yeah, set yeah. access rights against visitor groups as well. So you can do quite a lot with them. You can say editors can only edit between three and five PM or something. <laughs> or that's specific. Um, permissions on the action block. It's like if you didn't want your sort of day to day editors to go and monkey around with I mean it seems like it's very modular and it does stuff. Yeah. Compared to what we've got that's nice and flexible. But just in terms of um, the types of blocks, you can just block certain ones from you know your editors setting up crazy stuff on their pages or you know, in terms yeah. of those You stuff. can set permissions on um, blocks like you can in pages, yeah. um, but it's very common for uh, clients to want to create custom business rules against what blocks get put onto what pages and, yeah, and things like that. So you, you can you can do that through a bit of customization because it's specific to your rules. Okay. Yeah. So I get the impression that with the use of blocks, those are like dynamic properties on steroids. Right? Yeah, so and dynamic properties are slowly. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Pardon? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. dynamic content. Sorry, yeah. that's what I meant. Yeah. Um, so then, compared to previous versions, you could you could build and deploy a site using fewer page types, couldn't you, by using the blocks creatively? Uh, using dynamic content. <coughs> blocks. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, and it gives you a lot more flexibility as well. Yeah, but yeah. It, it can, you can yeah. also you can also work with pages in that fashion as well. So you can tell the CMS what content out of pages you want to reuse, depending on the context of where you drop it. So if I drop an event onto the event listing page, it might show different content if I drop it onto the home page as well. So there's there's a lot of flexibility around that as well. Same with blocks, like you, it might have a different context, so if I drop a block onto the home page, it might show different content to when I drop it onto the event page as well. Do you dig it? Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I'm just wondering how that works, but that's okay, that's a detail. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you can create multiple templates and renderers for the different blocks and the different pages, and depending on where the context of where it's been dropped, or the channel that's active, it will select the correct template, basically. 
Can you as a, a, an editor do, design your own templates or are you still relying on uh, people to code those? Uh, you're still relying. But you've got a lot of flexibility with the dragging and dropping of pages and blocks. But when it comes down to the CSS and all that sort of stuff, it's still development. <coughs> When people are using blocks, do you, can you find out what pages they're using them? Uh, yep. Um, That's helpful at the moment. We've got dynamic, dynamic content, and if we were to delete something, then we actually don't know what If I edit doing. the block, it says it's used on five pages, oh, right. and those are all, um, I can edit the pages from here. Oh, awesome. so it's oh. a bit too easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you get that out of the report book? Yeah, it's all in the API, so you could have a report that shows you where stuff is or what's linked to each other, all that sort of stuff. You can do the same for files as well. File manager, you can see what pages of files are being used on. Can you anchor between blocks? Anchor between blocks. Yeah, so create anchor points between the different blocks that you brought up on a page. You can't at the moment. Um, so not if you too sure what you mean. Mm -hmm. Like anchor points, so you can link up and down the page. Yeah. Jump to it. Um, I've never tried. <laughs> um, I think the anchors are probably in the context of the editor and the page. So I'm leaning towards no. No, I don't think you can, but it'd be nice to. If you're going to build up your page, it would be quite nice to be able to do that. There's, yeah. there's probably a sneaky one. <laughs> well, when do you want to do that? If you have um, a massive page. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a page that's quite long, and particularly when you're going into um, a mobile device, mm. it's nice to be able to jump to a, a particular section of that page, mm. and that page is normally made up of different blocks. Mm. So it's actually taking them straight down to the top of the block. Okay, yeah, okay. The blocks. Is that, is that actually a template when it's rendered on the page? Uh, however, however, you implement the template, so yeah. So if you render the template, you can just see it's used to the page. Jump, 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 What do you think? Oh, it's, uh, we've really it's cheaper, there's a lot less to it. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, funnily enough, that's, um, no, that's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's actually yeah, that's a problem we, we have. Like, when we demo to a lot of enterprise clients, they like, show us the t tough stuff. Like, yeah, we're, we're, cool. used, we're used to, you're supposed to see all these options all the time, and it's supposed to be, we're buying something, it's supposed to have all this. Yeah, but it's still there, but it just doesn't show. It's context driven, so you only need to see what you need to <coughs> see, whatever you're doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. No, and uh, social reach does exist for CMS 6 or 2. I just had a look. Yeah, and you just needed one plan. Yeah, but the, uh, but the we're just getting the six, so we're the discovering what, what we can do with six. With, so, so it's even more. So. The redirect plugin is great, actually. Just yeah. Because we're moving a lot of stuff around and <coughs> just being able to rename stuff. Okay. Cool. <coughs> Good. Yeah, so we're a bit early. Are we? Yeah, I think so. Or. Ten minutes on it, yeah. But it, and this was the CMS, sort of what's new in CMS. The next session we will go through sort of a little bit about the roadmap, and also show a bit about the commerce product, and also talk about the add-ons we have, the different layers of add-ons that we have, and a, a few of them. Mention a few of them. So.